So we're set. Start off with any questions, comments, issues so far? Anyone? You're all just ticking along, doing the reading, doing the projects. I told you it was an easy class. You just have to do the work. Uh, that's it. Uh, oh, I, I, I sent this out via Slack, but I'll just repeat it here. I am looking for a TA for next semester. Uh, and so if any of you, it's, it's sort of a guaranteed 20 hours a week whether or not you actually have that much to do. Uh, and so like I see it as sort of a senior fellowship. Uh, it's not to say you don't have to do anything, but you usually don't have to do 20 hours a week. Anyway. Uh, so if you're interested, DM me. Uh, again, as per my, my Slack message, I'll wait until the midterm, because I usually See what your answers are in midterm, give me a sense of how well you understood the material in the class. Uh, but as I said, there is uh, extra consideration if you're actually going to be here next fall as well. So I suspect most of you probably hope you won't be. Uh, yes? What are the details on the midterm? I don't know if we didn't wear it, so I was just wondering if we have a week or. Oh, for, for the time of the midterm? Uh, yeah, the time and then like, is it, is it like open note, is it closed note? Well, last week we talked about that on the first day of class. I, I wasn't in the class. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't in here yet. <laughs> the midterm, and, and it's worth repeating, and we'll do, we'll do a midterm review before the midterm. Okay. Midterm is entirely online. You'll have a 24-hour period uh, to complete it uh, from midnight to midnight on Monday, five weeks from today. Open book, open note, open everything except fellow classmates. Uh, the questions will be just like the questions you were seeing for the reading, uh, particularly for the three books. The three questions there and the three books are literally taken from prior midterms. So that's what the questions will look like. It will be, here's a real, here's a situation, you know, identify so many risks with a cite, at least one citation for each one. Uh, scoring, and we, we talked about that some in the, uh, the start, but I'll, I'll repeat. A minimal correct response will get you B, get you four points out of five. If you want an A, I'm expecting a few sentences that show you really understand the issue and explaining why it's relevant and so on. And when we do the midterm review, uh, I'll, I'll bring that up, and the scoring criteria will actually be on the midterm itself. So they refer to there. Let me start saying now, and I'll, I'll try to repeat this as often as possible. When you're doing the midterm, compose your answers locally. <laughs> compose your answers locally. Every semester, I have a few students who are in the middle of the midterm and learning suite hiccups, and they've lost everything they've typed in. Uh, so compose your answers locally and then copy and paste in the learning suite. Yes? Um, will we be having class today? No, no class. All I've got is midterm. So originally, when I, the very first time I taught it was actually here in the Tanner building. And we had desks like this, and everyone had power and so on. I thought this was cool, and I actually gave the midterm. Everyone plugged in their laptops. And then the next semester I taught it, I was in the MARB, and there were like four outlets in the entire classroom. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, and everyone was in these little tiny, you know, the little, little tiny chairs with the flip-up desk thing and so on. So after that, I switched to giving you a 24-hour period. You can take whatever you want. No class that day. Uh, you all get credit for attendance. You know. mm -hmm. Let's skip the midterm. Skip the midterm. You have another problem. <laughs> uh, midterm is 25% is of your grade, and you need at least a 60% on the midterm. I think in five years I have had maybe one student who has not hit the 60% on the midterm. And the average, the average grade on the midterm is usually about 94%, 93%. have to go back and add a few semesters together. My, my concern here is not, this is not grading on the curve, this is if you do the work you get the A. That's this type of class. Because what I'm concerned about, as I said the very first day, is I want you to know and understand this stuff, know that it's real, 
because it's what you're going to face when you go out in the industry. And a lot of you, as, as per your answers in the lectures, a lot of you are already facing this stuff. That's why you all have great stories saying, oh yeah, that happened. But what I want you to understand is that that's not unique to your situation. It's pretty much standard. And that's what you're dealing with. We'll come back here. Oh, I didn't plug it in. That's my card. Oh. Okay. Let's look at your architecture documents real quick here. We'll go in reverse order. So we're going to start with Werewolf. Uh, architecture and design document. Who's chief architect for Werewolf? Give us a one to two minute explanation of your architecture, which actually looks pretty straightforward here. Yeah, I, honestly, I was like, how do we, I don't know. So if it looks super simple, that's because it is. Well, it's it's a one semester class. Right. So yeah. um, I didn't want to architect the heck out of this thing. I yep. certainly could have. Yep. But anyway, so we have the front end. This is like the Jackbox games thing. Yeah. Right? So, Everyone's on their phones, they all have, they all access the player UI, and then there's probably going to be like a shared UI on the TV. So those just call APIs to the back end, um, back end does function calls to manage data within the database, which essentially just says like, these are the games currently not um, being played, these are the players for each of those games. And then there's like a votes table that would say, oh, you know, in this game, these players voted for this player. Kind of just uh, through SQL and whatnot, count up, um, you know, which players get the most votes and how many of each type of player there are, where we'll fill it through. Um, and that's pretty much it. Okay. What, what's the hardest problem you think you guys face? Um, <laughs> right now, it's um, finding a web server because I tried to set one up in my apartment, and apparently, my apartment blocks any signals that they detect as. Web servers. Web servers. And so I'm like, I, I don't know what to do there. So just we're kind of lacking in um, technology, like being able to set up a server and stuff. I've, I've debated bumming something off my work, but I'm technically not supposed to do that. So. Um, they would never know. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, of course, they did. Yes. OK. Uh, just, as a, just as a heads up, you can get three books through GitHub. Uh, like student pro, like, and then digital ocean. Oh, really? Exactly. Yeah, so look into that. Yeah, actually, I call that out on Slack and say, how's that again? Set up a web server. I'm sure someone can understand. Okay. We'll have that be. We'll have suggestions. Meal planning assistant. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Uh, oops. Where's your architecture back? Sorry, one minute. We have a, we made it. Um, yeah, I'm fixing that. I must have not saved it when I put it on. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Oh. I must have not saved it when I put it on. One minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we can go on to the next one. Okay, yes, that. we will go on to the next one while they're doing that. Chess. Architecture and design document. There we go. It's cheap architect for chess. Okay, give us. I don't care. There we go. Okay, give us a... Uh... Yeah, so pretty much we decided um, to go with kind of a model view presenter um, architecture um, just because we have, we have the game and we have to like, have a back end that will keep track of the game and make sure all the pieces are like, moving in the right ways and stuff like that. Um, and we kind of came up with a, like some core objects that were important for our implementation. Uh, we had the game and the chess board itself and then pieces that would be on the board. Um, so um, I guess that's a pretty quick overview of our, our game. Um, okay, what's, what's the hardest problem you're facing? Um, I think we were thinking that one of the hard problems would be making sure the pieces are moving in the right ways and actually calculating the finish of the game when, when somebody has won or not. Yep. Those, those are actually two very, very challenging problems with any kind of, with any kind of game um, implementation, particularly where you're talking two-player 
Okay, uh, snow shoveling. We will get back to the one we skipped. Okay, who's chief architect for snow shoveling? Yes. Yeah, so we have the front end is, is just a, a React native application, and we're using like React context to, for our state management on the front end, and then we're using Firebase as the back end. So if that makes it super easy, basically, just from the in the, the JavaScript, in the React code, you can create functions to touch the database in the back end. Uh, and then Firebase comes with a database, which is a NoSQL uh, document-based database. And so, yeah, it just the front end makes a request to the back end for uh, manipulating or retrieving or making new objects, new documents. And then, and then at the back end, the Firebase, Firebase also takes care of authentication. So, okay. What's the hardest problem you think you guys are facing? Uh, <clears throat> maybe just with like a smaller team size, we're cutting back a lot of features. Yeah. So, but besides that, it's been pretty smooth. Okay. Okay. Uh, Game Boy emulator is chief architect. That's me. Uh, so I think the sequence diagram here. Uh, explain the architect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there are essentially four subsystems uh, dictated by the Game Boy, uh, like hardware itself. Uh, you have up there, which is SDL. That's going to be our main loop in charge of keyboard uh, and rendering. Uh, SDL is also in charge of the timings uh, for the CPU. So the SDL ensures that the CPU is cycling the appropriate amount uh, based on the hardware itself. Uh, the CPU is interacting with the memory. Uh, through read and write calls. Uh, and similarly, the TPU, which is the pixel processing unit, is also going to be interacting with the uh, memory for those same read and write calls. Uh, SDL, uh, at the end of each uh, 1 60th of a second, uh, makes a call to get the frame buffer from the TPU, and that's rendered. Cool. What's the hardest thing here? Let's see, get some more stuff here. Yeah, that's just the sequence. Um, the hardest part is probably mostly the research phase. Because you know the Game Boy is it's a big system, uh, and there are lots of nuances and details that you have to look into and try to understand. Uh, so it's the research into understanding those nuances and also understanding where you can cut and where to simplify things as well. Cool. Okay, Valeria, the chief architect. Okay, so here we just have a good representation of how the front end interacts with the back end and just the different states that it can go through. So we just went through and laid out the different states that we need to flow through in order to play the game. And so basically, you're going to be have a start game, and then once you enter the game, there's going to be three main phases until it determines that the game is over, and then we'll go to an end game screen where it displays if you won or lost. And then if you scroll down, I just laid out kind of like the class structure on the back end, so, and how they interact there. So, there was some complex stuff going on there, but it's all kind of there. But, yeah, and then the rest is just a more detailed description of the functions, so. What's the hardest problem you're facing? I think just hardly any of us have used React Native, so it's just kind of a learning experience for most of us, but yeah, it's been fun. No finding those when we skip those ones. Yeah. Yes. There we go. Okay, chief architect. Okay, so we'll start with the front end. The, there's basically two main functions that um, our app is going to do, which is adding meals to the database and then using that and those meals to get a meal plan back. So the front end will have these two main objects that will be sent back in facade. Uh, which will then send them to the back, and we'll talk about when we get there, either along the get meal plan route or the address view route. And if we go down to the back end, Oops. and it's on the same page, just below it. And then it goes to the back end, where it'll either go to the meal plan handler or to the rest of the handler, where it will either be added to the database or it will use recipes in the database to generate a meal plan and then send it back. And then there's 
all those lines show the dependencies of yeah. things in the backend. So the hardest problem you're facing? The first problem that we were worried about was getting MongoDB set up, because none of us had worked for that. But it sounds like Antonio's got that going. So now the next hardest thing will just be the nitpicky stuff of getting the front end and back and connected and figuring out how to get the meal plan, like actually the brains of the meal plan plan are working. But and that's, yeah. Well, we have other features if we end up running other features that we have on the back burner. We have more time. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other? Oh, go away. No, I don't want to turn this Jesus. Jack, I'm so close. It's listening. <laughs> 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 My very first class, back then it was 130. <laughs> Oh, look at this. It's dictating now. <laughs> That's a little scary. <laughs> Alan Ashton was my professor for 132. Great man. Great professor. Uh, at some point here, I'll tell you my, my word perfect story. Uh, but in that class, he said something which I, which struck me and which I have quoted for 47 years now is Ashton's Law. Talking about software, he said, usually when someone tries to do something for you, they end up doing it to you. Uh, and that, that is a constant in software design where someone says, oh, we're going to upgrade your software, we're going to add this new nifty feature and start doing this, and it's like, go away, I don't want this, I want it to work just like the way it did. I don't know how many of you saw the image I posted <laughs> about Duo. Uh, it's like, are you kidding me? I have to use this all the time. This is my authentication when I have to log into BYU. And they swapped the sides for accept and reject, and made the buttons smaller. It's like, are you stupid? <laughs> yes. They did that on Android too, just throwing it out there. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's just it's it's bad. In my opinion, it's very bad product design, and I have no idea what to do, what inspired that. Okay, let's talk about people work. Uh, I lumped all these parts together because they're a quick read, and there's really only a few major themes that are covered in these parts. Uh, and plus, you're reading the book. It's not like this is this is not difficult technical stuff to understand. These are truisms about sociology and psychology within a software development organization. And once you've read it, it's like, okay, yeah, I understand that. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, explain Turing machines to you. I'm trying to explain management. Of course, one's probably more logical than the other. Uh, the ideal team size if the project lends itself to it is one person. Because there are no communication issues, you know what you're trying to do. The biggest problem with one person is you may not come up with all the necessary invention necessary to it's necessary twice to complete the project. So the ideal team size, in my opinion, and frankly in my experience, is a small team of people who all get along well together and who are all quite talented at what they're doing. Most managers, most companies, don't do a good job of growing productive teams. They see programmers as being interchangeable. That your components, oh yeah, we lost so-and-so, well, we'll just hire someone else who's worked in Python for five years, and I'm sure she or he will just do a fine job. Uh, the challenge, and, and by the way, even when you find great people, and we're going to be talking about this today, it doesn't make them a team. In fact, if you have bright, talented developers and you simply put them together, often you have clashing egos. This is pretty much my experience at Pages. We're going to talk about this. But what you want in an effective software engineering team are these aspects they have. 
low turnover, sense of identity, sense of alignment, ownership, and they enjoy what they're doing. My experience at Pages was basically learning these lessons for myself. There are some things I did well, there are some things I did not do well at all, and luckily I had other people to help me out. With Pages, I went and hired and took my time hiring the best developers I could find, and I was not prepared for the clash of egos and opinions. And I was, and we had, I was acting both as chief architect and as project manager. Never want to do that. <laughs> because you, no, you don't do either one terribly well. I was frankly a better architect than I was a project manager. But between all of us, we did things to bring the team together. And I'll, I'll defer some of that uh, until one of the Webster readings uh, that talks about a goal alignment. But one of the things that helped was that one of the engineers I had hired, Rick Gessner, had had training in conflict resolution. And so when we were having the initial set of problems with all these bright, talented developers butting heads and arguing and so on and so forth, Rick came to me and said, look, I've, I've had training in conflict resolution and trying to get teams to get along, let me do stuff. And we had team sessions where Rick basically said, here's how you disagree. And here's how you do it without egos getting involved. Here is how you challenge without it becoming a clash of ego or who's right or wrong. And he gave us a set of vocabulary and techniques that went a long ways towards reducing the conflict among the teams. Yes? Are we going to talk about any of the specifics of that in this class? Because that sounds really helpful. <laughs> I wish I could remember the specifics of Rick said, because this is roughly 30 years ago. Uh, we will talk about the specifics of what I added, because I remember exactly what I added and how important it was. And that's going to be one of the Webster readings, and we'll tie into that. Sense of identity. As it turned out, the first two people actually, okay. One of the first developers I hired, I fired a month later. He was a local developer uh, from a software company that had some success in Macintosh software, and actually a lot of success. And he was looking for something new, and this was, this was my first mistake in hiring. Uh, I, I, hired him, I really didn't have anyone to screen him with, except I think the only other developer at that point may have been my sister Deirdre, who I've worked with before, so I, she was known quantity. She was great. But this person, uh, who I will call Fred, because this is going to go out on YouTube, uh, we were developing a brand new concept in desktop publishing. And there were, some, there were some serious problems and research we had to do. And I gave Fred, I said, here's what I want you to focus on. You know, where our end goal is to get to this. This is what I want you to focus on. Uh, I need you to go and think deep thoughts about this. And come back to me. And my expectation was a month of thought and research. And Fred came back a couple days later with a sheet of paper with a few, frankly, rather simple and shallow ideas that, that didn't really address what I was doing. And I said, no, you know, thank you, Fred. This is nice, but I, I really need you to take a deep dive into these concepts and figure out the implications of what we're going to do. <clears throat> and he came back a week later, really had nothing, and it was sort of like, well, I'm done. And so I looked at it and said, well, no, this isn't really. And I went through this for about a month with him, where it was clear that what, for whatever reason, he appeared to be lacking the skills to do the kind of architectural design and conceptual thinking that I wanted. 
Uh, and then he started coming in late and leaving early and everything else. And after a month, I just went full the report and said, sorry, you're out of here. So sometimes that has to happen. <clears throat> the next person I hired was Bruce Henderson, who 30 years later, 31 years later at this point, uh, is still one of my closest friends and we're colleagues. There's still projects we do together. But I didn't know him then. I simply came highly recommended. And unlike almost, any, actually unlike anyone else I hired except for me, he had actual experience doing development in Objective-C on Next Step. He'd done it at Ashton Tate. What was lucky was not happy with Ashton Tate. He was looking for a new job. I brought him in. Well, as it happened, the three of us, myself, my sister Deirdre and Bruce, were all great fans of the movie The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. How many have seen this movie? Okay. Oh, seriously? <laughs> seriously? Oh my gosh, I'm ashamed of all of you. <laughs> this is one of the great cult movies, great geek cult movies of all time. The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. Watch it. Trust me, you'll enjoy it. Uh, we're all great fans of it. And in it, the lead character has his, his team, his crack team, which is called Team Banzai. And it was Bruce who immediately dubbed us Team Bonsai, and that became our team identity. Uh, when I wrote Pitfalls of Object-Oriented Development, it is dedicated to Team Bonsai, which are all the developers we work with. All of our servers and machines in-house had names that were pulled out of the movie. I can't believe you guys have watched this movie. Come on, educate yourselves. <laughs> Probably haven't watched Big Trouble in Little China yet. Okay, a few more there. Extra, oh, come on, guys. Extra credit? <laughs> Seriously. Watch, go watch Adventures of Buckaroo Bonsai. I'll give you one point extra credit. <laughs> it's on video. We'll Seriously. No, it's on video. It's everywhere. And once you watch it, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But these were the things that we worked on developing to build ourselves as a team. And, and once we got over the initial butting of heads, we were a team. There was zero voluntary turnover in five years. There was one developer, which he hired later on, who ended up having some real, another developer, different from Fred. This developer was very bright and actually very good and he, a couple of years into all this, was developing some real emotional problems, was becoming more and more abusive towards everyone else, uh, was sure that the whole project was going to fail and voiced that frequently and often. Uh, and it finally reached a point where, and that, by then we, we had a VP of engineering, Jim Hamley, one of the best people I ever worked with, who took him and fired him. Uh, we had layoffs about a year before the, 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 the uh, company actually closed. We lost two engineers through layoffs. But in that, we, we literally, in five years, we never had a software engineer simply leave for another job. And that's because of the focus, the constant focus we had, first me and then myself and Jim Hammerly, on doing what was necessary to gel the team and keep the team together. Uh, now, the problem we now have is that, or the problem, the problem that often occurs is that organizations, particularly upper management, particularly upper management who does not understand software development, do things that break up teams, that destroy the effectiveness of teams, that do the opposite of what we have here under a gel team. They try to micromanage it. They try to do busy work. They, well, you've, you've read all this. You should have read all this. What well, a question I have for you now is, in your experiences and recognizing that most of you haven't been out there long enough to be part of a sustained team, but some of you have, what have been your experiences where you've seen either your employer doing the right thing for building teams or doing the wrong things that were destroying teams? Yes. Um, at one company that I worked for, they were trying to increase productivity and um, 
like getting projects done. And so before we had um, functional teams, which is like, okay, the core, the front end, the engineering team, et cetera. And so they decided that for every um, quarter that they would um, have a list of projects that they were going to do and have a list of, okay, we need about like two front ends, like one back end, and they would create these, they call them cross-functional teams. They would be together from anywhere for three to six weeks and then they'd be disbanded. Um, but so you never have a team at all, really. No. And that, you, but we were supposed, still supposed to like communicate with our original functional team and like work with them, but we had completely different schedules for them, and it was just fun. There is, and I've already said this, and we'll come back to this time and again. Uh, there is this concept in management that they they think that. Software engineering is like manufacturing. And it's like, okay, we just need to get an expert you know, from column A and one from column B, and we'll put them together, and they'll be together for four weeks, and they'll turn out something that's perfect. Uh, and then we can break them up and assign them elsewhere to be work. That's not how software engineering works, for the most part. <laughs> Unless you're simply doing the same thing over and over again. Yes? Would you argue then that somebody in upper management should have experience with software design and management? That way they understand what the software teams go through and can organize the teams? Or in, the Yes, team? and in theory that's what the CIO and or CTO, Chief mm -hmm. Information Officer or uh, Chief Technical Officer should have. They should understand that and they should be the advocate for the proper approach to software engineering development. Uh, and that's, that's what I did at Pages. I was CTO at Object Systems Group, which was a consulting firm. I was CTO. Yeah. Uh, and there were times when I had near shouting matches with Tony Gibson, the president, because he was trying to propose something and I was telling him, no, that's absolutely wrong and impossible. You know, we can't do that. Don't make promises we can't keep, you know, to our corporate clients. Uh, the problem is a lot of CIOs, uh, and, and actually I, I don't know what it's like nowadays because I've been doing my own thing for too long. But CIO typically was a role and what you had were people who at some point were sort of uh, MIS, business level, you know, information systems and had never really written a line of code themselves in their lives. Uh, and so they really didn't have that. With CTOs, the problem that happens a lot there is you get CTOs <clears throat> who haven't failed enough or who keep excusing their failures. I, I, my daughter, Crystal, who's now left her former company so I can name it, Solution Reach. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, they brought in a new CTO a few years ago who's going to do everything with microservices. And they were going to transform all the existing legacy systems to microservices. And this was going to make them hundreds of millions of dollars. And they were going to put all this out. And their very first microservice was going to be this birthday reminder. Basically, Solution Reach provides support to dentist offices, some doctor's offices, and so on, so that Customers can go to, they set up portals for each office and customers can go and schedule appointments and get reminders and the, the, the uh, professionals, the medical or dental professionals can go there to see what their schedules looks like and communicate with them and so on. They're setting up a business reminder microservice that they're going to employ to all their customers. Took them a year and it didn't work well. Now, if you're looking at re-engineering all of the back-end stuff as microservices, and it takes you a year to do a microservice for birthdays, you know something's going wrong. Uh, after, I believe it was a year and a half, the CTO was, was invited to leave. Uh, I believe he's at another company here in the Valley, so if I can get his name, I'll let you know, and you may not want to go to work there. Uh, but, but the point is, Yes, there should be someone up there who really understands it. And that gap of understanding happens time and again. It's we're back to the management sees us as unreliable wizards. Because they don't understand that there are some things that are simple and there are some things that are impossible. And 
they don't understand when we say, yeah, this, this one's simple, this one's impossible. And these are sort of in the middle. Uh, it's hard to convey that if they have not had that experience themselves. Any other stories about teams that worked well or did not work well? Yes? So the company I'm at right now, I guess when they first started, they had like huge turnover like all the time. And so the founder like went and met with all the people that left and was like, just like, you know, let me know, like, why'd you leave? Um, and it was all like basically like they felt like the company didn't really value them as like employees. And so they he, like did a ton of work to like make sure that like they like changed their whole like structure and like how they communicated with their employees and like benefits and everything else. And so now like we have like really good communication like set up with between like the different teams and between like our boss and like us. And so there's like scheduled meetings like frequently that like where we're meeting like with different people like either within our team and our boss or like just me and my boss and like get to like talk about anything that like might be impeding our work or like things that are going well, things that aren't going well. And that like really helps like not only like our team to like have like the same goals but also like any like little thing that's going on like we have a chance to talk about it and like get it out of the way before it becomes like a huge problem. And so it's like it worked really well in like us being able to like get things done and like get over any hurdles. And and it's you know, and this is this is not rocket science. This is not hard, mm -hmm. but simply listening and you know having you say, look, this is it, it's it's like I've, I've said and I'll I'll keep saying this so for, forgive the repetition. When I'm brought in to review these multi-million dollar, sometimes multi-hundred million dollar projects, they're going wrong. I talk with the people in the trenches. And as I've said, usually by the time I've talked to 10 or 12, I know what's going wrong. And I, I didn't, I, it's nothing magic, I simply asked them. <laughs> I said, what's going wrong? And, and what you want is a large enough sample size that you can sort of filter out the hobby horses of any given individual developer. Oh, I think they should be using <coughs> Go for this, you know, or something like that. And you start to hear the same thing over and over again. And that's when you recognize it. And this is exactly what, what this technique is for. Because as a manager, if, if I'm having two or three engineers saying, you know what the biggest impediment is, it's this. It's like, I need to take that really seriously. That probably is it. And you, you not only clear up the impediment, but they feel listened to. What's your turnover like now? Like none. Like yeah. None yeah. If, 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 if you treat your development teams well, they will be loyal, but loyalty is a two-way street. And that's something management that is like, oh, we're giving them a job. They should be thankful. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> there they can leave and find better jobs elsewhere. You need to give them a reason to stay. Uh, spaghetti dinner, this is simply saying, give your team things to do as a team. Organize. At Pages, we had a team outing to go see Terminator 2 when it came out to the theaters. It was great. We oohed and on over the special effects, which were so far above or beyond anything <laughs> that had been released previously. But that was that. I mean, we took we took an afternoon, went saw it in the afternoon. It wasn't a night thing. It's like during work hours. Like we all went, went to the theater, bought lots of popcorn, and so on. Company paid for the whole thing. It was great. Uh, Chemistry for team formation. We're back to this, and this is actually repeats some of the other stuff. Uh, make a cult of quality. How do you feel, and in particular, I'm interested if any of you have had this experience, how do you feel when, when your company or your organization has put into production code that you frankly think is crap, and you know where all the flaws are? How do you feel about delivering or having code that's got sort of your name on it, quote unquote, it's got defects that you know could be fixed and the company just didn't care. Any of you had that experience? Anyone? Oh, good. Good for you. You will. Oh, yes. Class. Huh? Class? <laughs> CS classes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is crap, but I need the grade. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, uh, provide lots of closure. Steve Jobs liked to say that real art is ship. And there, there is a thrill in delivering that 1.0 new product. 
Uh, you sometimes don't have much of a thrill when all the bugs came. Sundog Frozen Legacy, our goal was that the West Coast Computer Fair, which was the big PC show in 1984. Man, I'm old. Uh, it's almost 40 years ago. But that was our target, and I worked 100 hour weeks uh, for a few weeks before the show. And we got there, and we had a nice booth, and we had three or four Apple II set up that you know people could come through and actually play the game. And I was actually pretty convinced. I mean, I had written 90% of the program. Uh, I was pretty convinced that this was this was a solid program. And I started to have people coming over and say, "There's there's some kind of bug here." Man, it's fire bug notebook and everyone had four days, 30 bugs. It was it was crushing to my. <laughs> I think I was like, I thought this was good. Uh, now the the good thing is that this was a great test environment because there was only one other bug ever reported in the program after I fixed those thirty bugs. I took them back. Took me about three weeks to fix them all, and the one bug that was still reported in that version that that was the ship one one with all those bug fixes. Everyone liked the bug because what you could do is you could go into a bar and try to negotiate to buy a uh, particular drug or a particular component for your ship and said, I'll take it when, they, when the little diagram popped up where you could pick up the icon. If you had like a thing of beer or a hamburger, you could go and swap it and then say, oh, never mind. Uh, and you'd get the item for free. <laughs> Everyone loved that one. It was a very popular cheat for the game. We fixed that in version 2.0. Uh, uh, the uh, Protective Reserve provides strategic but not tactical decisions. How many of you have had an experience where upper management has said, we want you to do it this way and you know it's not the right way to do it? Anyone had that experience? Anything to share? Ah, oh, you will. Just so you know. Uh, allow and encourage heterogeneity, meaning mix up your teams. Get people with different backgrounds. It, it wasn't planned that way, but because I was really focused on experience and so on, we had uh, quite a diverse group uh, in terms of uh, well, certainly in terms of male and female, we had three three female developers and a, a team of ten, uh, which is probably greater than the percentage, probably about ten percent females in software engineering back at that time. So we're sort of triple the representation. Uh, they came from different in different companies. They had different experiences. Uh, had a wide range of ages. Uh, Peter Linz is probably. 20 at the time, had a GED. The only reason I hired him was I hired Rick Gessner, and Rick said, and Rick came over, hired Rick through a headhunter. I think Rick was the only one literally we hired through a recruiter. Uh, and Rick said, look, there's this guy I know back in Arizona, you really need to bring him in. Uh, and Peter, I want to say, was 19 or 20. And Rick said, he's written his own object-oriented operating system. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's enough to get my attention. Brought Peter in, interviewed him, uh, and he was. He was absolutely brilliant. Uh, he may be the single most brilliant person I've ever hired. And uh, he was, again, this was a high powered development team. Peter understood my architecture better than anyone, and he suggested improvements to it on a regular basis. And, and he, he was very low key about it, you know, he'd come back to me and say, by the way, I think if, if we change this part of the architecture here, we could do this, and I'd look at it and say, oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and the last year at Pages, I was spending a lot of time uh, traveling with the CEO because we were trying to raise more funding and or get someone to buy us. <laughs> and I pretty much turned the architect job over to Peter. All, you know, everyone else was older, everyone else had far more experience. Peter was the one who understood the architecture the best. And he was the one I trusted with what we had. So. 
Uh, fertile soil, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is all good stuff. Uh, this is all stuff you've read. Uh, people hate change. Yeah, you've heard that from me. Uh, chaos and order. Any questions about the rest of these chapters here? Again, they're all fairly self-explanatory. There's nothing technical. There's more things to consider, particularly things to consider once you're old enough to or old enough. Once you're established enough in your job to have influence to make changes. So any questions or comments on the rest of people where things that you thought were great, things you thought they were wrong about, anything like that? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you guys know the trick. Don't ask questions. <laughs> Go home early. Let's see here. Did that right? Oh, I did. I keep turning on the auto dictate. Okay, now you ask specifics. This is what I we did at pages. And this was this was in conjunction with the stuff that Rick was doing, or Gessner was doing. And I don't know where this idea came from. In other words, I don't know if this is something I had read, something I figured out on my own. I honestly don't remember. Like I said, we're, we're talking 40 years ago, or 30 years ago. But <clears throat> it became clear to me that the best way for to build team cohesion was to make sure we were all supporting each other's goals. And I realized I didn't know necessarily why everyone else was there. So we did a full day offsite. Uh, this was at a, uh, as I recall, it was at a hotel at Mission Bay in San Diego. Nice time of year. And the room we had reserved had an outside patio so we could sit and have, you know, sea breezes and see the sailboats on Mission Bay and, you know, puffy clouds. San Diego has great weather. It's my hometown. Uh, and I had, I had flip turret to write on. And my first question to every member of the development team is, why are you here? What do you want to get out of being here at Pages? Why did you accept the job and what is it you hope to accomplish? And for each and every one of us, I wrote the goal, the goals we had. Most of us had a couple, a couple compelling reasons. I was like, well, you know, I'm looking to win the geek lottery, or you know, I, this is cool stuff, and I want to do this, or I want to be, you know, have my name on a shipping product, and so on. So for all of us, we ended up with this sheet with everyone's goals, and then I tore that off and taped it up somewhere and said, okay, now what we need to come up with, and that, that didn't take terribly long. That was, you know, maybe. I said, we need to come up with a set of team goals that we are going to try and accomplish as Team Bonsai. And if we accomplish these, we will meet every single per every person's goal or goals. And this took really the bulk of the day. We debated a lot of different things and how to cast the goals and so on. But we finally came up with a set of team goals. And we were all agreed. This is what we're working for as a team. And if we do that, we will, at least in theory, if the market holds up and so on, meet everyone's individual goals. And then and only then we said, OK, now, how, how do we tweak our team goals so that, oh, by the way, they support the company's goals, <laughs> which are to ship a successful product you know, by a certain deadline. In other words, the first focus was on the individual goals, and then the goals as a team, and then on the company. Now, I'm not sure how happy Larry, our CEO, would have been if he had known that was my approach. <laughs> he probably would have said, here are the company goals, and then you have to come up with the team goals to support them, and then personal goals can sort of support the team goals. It was completely the other way around. But we were all working for each other, and we were working as a team. And clearly, you know, we're, we're all grown-ups. We know we want the company to succeed because the company going out of business isn't going to help us achieve any of those goals. So 
this is something to keep in mind as you move out there when you find yourself in a team setting consider you know this concept this will be out there on my website forever and ever and you've got slides and everything else that your team goals should be cast in such a way as to support everyone's individual goals. That is a critical element for building a team. And it's the reason, one of the reasons I think we had, in effect, zero voluntary turnover. It's because everyone knew that their goals were the focus of the team goals. And that's what we're all working for. Any questions, observations? Yes? I had a manager that did, or have a manager that did something very similar to this in like a one-on-one. -on -one. He does one-on-one -on -one meetings with all everyone that he's over yeah. once a month. And he was asking about school and like how it was going. And I kind of mentioned that I was making sure we're working as many hours as I wanted to and also keep with school. He's like, so Qualtrics goals mean like you will produce product, you'll write good code. Your goals right now, your main goals are Education. Those goals can kind of conflict, and that's okay. But it is in no one's best interest that you fail your classes. So, like, take the time to pass your class. And I really appreciated that he, like, yeah. he said that, like, oh, oh, Jeez. I'm not just here to write code. Like, they don't care about me just like to produce code and like at all at all of their costs. It's like, oh, like they care about me and getting my, what I want to get done done as well. And that I appreciated that a lot. And that's how you build loyalty. It makes you feel more loyal. It's kind of like uh, the the you know if you're going to change, if you have the temptation to change job, your first thought is, you know, Qualtrics really has been treating me well, and it's clear they're focused on helping me succeed with some of my personal goals. That may not be the case in this company I go to, so I may stay here. Loyalty is a two-way street, and smart managers will show loyalty to their uh, people they manage because that in turn engenders loyalty towards company. Uh, anatomy of Runaway IT Project. Okay, this is, <laughs> I, I'm now I'm assuming that you've read all this, and this, this is an actual memo with some, you know, details changed, because I have this posted public. But this was a project that I reviewed three times in three years. And each time, I said, okay, here are the problems you're facing, here are the corrections you need to make. And then they brought me back, you know, I did that the first time, they brought me back a year later, and it's like, well, you know what? You still have these problems. <laughs> and here's what's happening as a result of them. And then they brought me back the third time, and this is, this is literally the memo I wrote. Uh, and the, as you may recall from it, pretty much everything was wrong. <laughs> this was a this was a uh, project that was was really on the glide path towards crashing and burning on almost every level. And the thing to recognize is the things that are described in that memo. There's a good chance at some point you will encounter one or more of those in actual projects that you get assigned to or otherwise interact with. Anyone have any questions on this memo on any of the specific details or anything? Yeah? It's more of a comment. So when I read the Thermophile of Truth, I didn't entirely buy into the maybe it's a single link thing. So I thought it was really insightful to read this memo and see that, okay, sometimes it oh, yeah. really is a single yeah. link. Someone who's just not passing it up. Yep. Um, so I, I thought that was really interesting. Maybe yeah, I, and that was that was the, the disagreement I had with Jerry Weinberg. Jerry Weinberg came to the thermal client post and said, you know, I, I think it's just something, it's, it tends to get more favorable and less negative as it moves up. And, and I said, no, Jerry, I've actually seen, <laughs> I've seen where it's been individuals who are really blocking any bad news at all from moving up. And this was one of those cases, and it was so obvious. Uh, because we had, I, the company I was working for had consultants in there, and they're the ones that are saying, yeah, you know, we, we report all this stuff to, to, to this one individual. I think I called him Bob Winsome in the memo. Uh, <laughs> and when I first posted this, I had people Googling Bob Winsome, thinking he's a real person, and go back and say, no, no, this really is a pseudonym. 
And I frankly don't even remember what his real name was at this point. Uh, but it was very clear. Zero bad news went up. He kept a lot of people, both the, the company's employees and the consultants for the firm I worked for, were, were giving him bad news, and none of it was getting up past him. All he was reporting upward was good news. Uh, any other questions, comments, observations? Uh, septic code, oh my gosh. <clears throat> this is a reality, uh, and I, I see this a lot as an expert witness uh, with failed projects, that often what happens as a result is that the company brings in you know, they, they, they basically fire the development firm that's been working on this for one to two to three years. And they bring in an outside, or a different firm to come in and try to finish the project. And quite often, the different firm comes in and they look at this and say, this is so bad, we're just gonna throw it away. Uh, this happens a lot. The code is so poorly written so poorly architected, uh, and is so, in, in fact, if you go back to some of the comments about the code here, you find out just how wretched the code is. And by the way, the, the upshot of this was a year after this final review, the project was canceled internally and the, the executive vice president in charge of it was fired. Uh, and they, they spent four years and actually probably four or five years at this point, uh, and over $10 million in the whole project. Uh, this happens a lot. Sometimes the, the best solution is to throw it away. You may be able to have stuff that you can extract from it, but uh, uh, it's often a rewrite. I've already told you the story of being at, at Apple and being brought into, they, they had bought the source code of an existing product and wanted me to fix bugs and add features, and there was this one routine that was just, you know, it's like 20 pages of Pascal with several dozen go-to statements. Uh, and just, and I kept looking, I kept working and trying to figure out how to get a handle on it. And finally, I just said, no, I'm going to have to rewrite this. And figured out what it was supposed to do, you know, what the different components were, and wrote a brand new routine from scratch. Uh, there are some cases where I was able to, to I don't know if I ever even copy and pasted code. I'm sure there was stuff that I, I wrote something similar. But my rewritten version was like two or three pages long. Uh, and it, I cleared up all the bugs in the process of doing a rewrite and then was able to add features to it. Uh, I've already mentioned here the biggest software failure I know of was the uh, British, this British product, this project over the United Kingdom to do this UK-wide welfare system. I think it was oriented towards health. I have to go back. I've got a post on it. I can dig up. And it finally, it was late and late and late and late. And finally, it was suspended. And then it was canceled. And they went in to look to see if there was any source code that they could actually repurpose or use and their end decision was no, we just write the whole thing off. It spent 10 billion pounds, 16 billion dollars, and got nothing useful out of it, other than hopefully knowing what not to do next time. Any of you had experiences with septic code where you've been, found yourselves in a project where the existing code is so bad that you simply start over, throw it away, maybe use it as reference, but that's it? Yes. I mean, it's a school project, but um, essentially what happened, it was 236. And which is what? Uh, what is, what is the name? Discrete the structures. structures. There you go. Dis discrete structures. Okay. Anyway, um, I distinctly remember Corey Barker, who was my professor, saying, don't, don't use pointers. I thought I was smarter than that. So I, I used pointers. And then um, every time I fixed a bug, it would spawn like 16 more bugs. <laughs> And I was like, oh, it's okay. Once I figure out all these, you know, little spawns, bugs, it'll work. And I ended up spending like 20, 30 hours on that project. And then, like, I don't usually turn things in late. That was one of the few projects I've ever turned in late. And the next day in class, I just turned to someone and said, okay, how did you do this? 
and um, after realizing it was going to take me a little bit longer, I offered to pay them to like walk me through it, and I just <laughs> threw it out, coded it up in like two hours, turned it, it worked perfectly the first time. <laughs> so it was a little frustrating knowing I spent 30 hours on something that I could have just gotten done in two hours if I had actually finished it. Long. And, and that's actually a very, very important point, which is sometimes accept your code as your own. Sometimes you go down a path and you reach a point at which you look at this and say, I'm not going to get this to work the way I do. And you, you throw out what you've done uh, and start with a clean slate and say, I'm going to start over again. Yeah? Well, I think in that case, we've talked about planning to throw one away. And mm -hmm. there probably was a fair bit of learning about the system as you built the septic one, that once, once you go to yeah. A, a better design architecture, you could use all that learning and implement it fairly quickly. Well, yes, and, and you do, you know, refactoring as a normal part, both architecture and code, refactoring as a normal part. So there are things through them. Mm -hmm. But the problem here, the, the septic, is when you have this, this is not just you doing your stuff. This is septic on a project wide basis. And it's just never going to make it uh, into production. Or if it does, it's going to be fine. Negotiations and love songs is sort of brief. Uh, the important point for me and for you to take away here is that, and, and we've already talked about this some here, management, developers, and end users don't think in the same way. <laughs> they have different priorities. They have different games they're playing, if you will. Uh, and. Uh, that's part part of what I learned, and I really learned this when I got into consulting, where we were going into corporate settings and trying to help improve processes or help you know rescue projects and so on. I discovered that you really need, as as an outside firm coming in, there are really three parties that you have to keep happy: management, who's paying the checks, the internal software and information technology personnel who are supporting the existing systems and the end users who are using the existing systems. And if you hack any one of them off, they can, they can kill your engagement. So there's a bit of a balancing act. Any questions, comments, or observations on having read this? This was, this was a, I, I, I wrote this in like one sitting after watching A Beautiful Mind, I thought, oh my gosh, this sort of applies, game theory applies to software <laughs> issues within organizations. Yes? So would you say, like, having a, an opportunity, I mean, I guess you can't really do this with end users, but maybe you can, with uh, kind of do the goal, like, talk about everybody's goals, like, as a group, and then <coughs> kind of help them get on a level where they see and understand. Where Actually, you could. Uh, the question is getting representatives, and you get some turf issues here. Uh, because management, I mean, this is why I've, I've talked about uh, the conflict that often happens between sales and marketing and the developers within an organization to do with commercial software. Uh, I've had shouting matches with people in sales and marketing who, you know, come back and said, oh, yeah, we told them we'd add these features. Like, are you nuts? We can't add those features, <laughs> at least not anytime soon. You know, we're talking months and months trying to add. Well, well, you know, can't you just do this? No, we can't. Uh, motivations and goals often differ quite a bit. If you're aware of that, then you can talk to them, and it helps to understand the goals, what what matters to end users and developers. It helps to understand the end users, and it helps to understand management, and to learn to talk with them on their own footing. Uh, and that will... There's like another comment. It just seems weird to me that like management or whoever is like trying to sell their things, like making promises that they have absolutely no clue. Oh, and it happens all the time. So it's just <laughs> it happens all the time. It's just me. Mindset. They're expecting you to come up with a magic solution. Uh, I can tell you a story because this is all public record. I was got involved in this late. Uh, there was, and, and this is the sort of thing that happens out there. Uh, SAP, 
German software company does enter enterprise resource planning, probably one of the biggest vendors, probably the biggest vendor of, of ERP software in the world. <clears throat> They're always looking for new markets to move into. Well, they had a version of SAP that was geared towards waste management in Europe and dealt with you know, local laws and regulations and how waste management was typically handled there. One of their salespeople wanted to take this over to the United States. And so they did a big pitch to waste management, WM. Seen the big green and yellow WM logos, okay? They went to waste management and said, we have this great ERP software which you can use to replace all you know, your accounting and this and billing and so on and so forth. And they said, fine, but you know, is this off the shelf or is this going to be custom development? And this, this particular individual said, oh, no, no, it's, we have this functionality off the shelf. They did not have it off the shelf. Instead, she got some of their SAP developers to mock up a demo that made it look like their software had this functionality that was specific to the US off the shelf. And she demonstrated that and she represented it to the waste management personnel as being, this is our shipping software. And as a result, they signed like a $100 million contract and she got like a million dollar sales bonus for it. And then when time came to deliver it, they found, waste management found out that no, that wasn't their off the shelf software. And in fact, there were some real problems in changing the waste management software to adapt to US things. And there was a trial project in New Mexico that was an absolute disaster. Uh, and SAP kept promising, yo, oh, well, the next version will fix it, and they didn't. And finally, waste management sued them. Uh, it uh, went to trial, it settled before it went to trial. Uh, the, I don't know what the final settlement amount was, but waste management was asking for $200 million. Uh, the, uh, I actually got involved late because, you know, SAP settled, paid them. SAP has insurance firms that basically they pay for insurance policies to cover those kind of payments. And one of the insurance firms, Swiss Re, big international uh, insurance firm, basically said, you should have known you were going to be sued long before you did and notified us because their policy required notification uh, in the case of deciding whether they... So I basically reanalyzed the whole history of the project and said, yes, by this date, it was quite clear that <laughs> waste management was going to sue SAP because it was such a disastrous project. Uh, and I issued, and this was actually an arbitration in London, I was looking forward to actually going and, you know, having them pay my way to London. And I issued my expert report and the two parties settled. Uh, I think waste management agreed to pay some smaller portion of the insurance policy and, and SAP was willing to say, okay, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll settle for that. Anyway. That was a fun story. I'm not sure how relevant it was. <laughs> anyway, but yes, I guess this gets back to the point that, yeah, sometimes you have gross misrepresentation, near criminal misrepresentation on a part of marketing types. And I'd like to say that's not terribly common, but it happens more often than everybody might think. Let's take roll. Okay, let's talk about software quality assurance. And this We'll push it again. I won't take a break. Uh, take a break and drag the whole thing out too long. <clears throat> okay. How many of you have actually done work in quality assurance testing or whatever? How are you typically viewed within the organization you're doing this for? Are you esteemed? 
Are you seen as critical? Are you paid more than others? <laughs> For bizarre reasons, quality assurance is seen as a second-rate career in software development. And it shouldn't be. It is critical, and it's the, the irony is that all the, so many of the cost overruns and delays and projects and problems and defects are because companies are not willing to take the time to actually make the software work. Quality standards that would be laughed out of the market for any sort of actual physical device are tolerated and accepted as normal in software. And I think it's because of the virtual nature of it. Oh, by the way, all, all the slides are already up on the website, so. Uh, the, the myth is that software, that quality assurance is just testing. Uh, it's just something you do for a couple of weeks. I mean, literally, I, after we got our funding and we had Larry Spellhog as our CEO, great, I have tremendous respect for Larry. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to hire a director of quality. And Larry said, oh, can't we just hire some college students just like type on it for like three weeks before we ship? And I buried my face in my hands and said, no, Larry, we can't. <laughs> We need an honest goodness quality organization. And needs to be from there from day one. And and to Larry's credit, he said, okay. We hired Dave Creek, who is an outstanding director of quality and did a great job. Uh, still friends with him 30 years later. Uh, and it made a big difference in our product. But it's the, it's the place where management will cut back. They don't want to take the time, they don't want to spend the money. And as a result, a lot of software gets shipped that is just poor quality. And as a developer, that tends to be very demoralizing. Uh, again, we're back to, to Fred Brooks saying, yeah, you're going to spend 50% of your total schedule time testing whether or not you plan for that. <laughs> Uh, and another truism is that the later you find a defect, the more expensive in time and other costs it is to fix it. In other words, if you catch a problem in architecture and requirements and say, oh, we, this will be a problem or we don't want to do this, that's very easy. You're changing a few words in a document or changing a diagram and so on. If you're already in production, it's like, oh my gosh, <clears throat> we have to change the code, we have to push stuff out, and we have to make sure when we're fixing this bug, we're not introducing new bugs. And we're not breaking stuff that's out there. Uh, and from life cycle views, whether, whether you're going predictive or adaptive, waterfall or iterative, agile, whatever, testing is usually seen as a phase in the life cycle. And there doesn't tend to be the necessary focus on all the other SQA activities which we're about to talk about. Now, what happened, the, the genesis of, and this is, this is my own model. I did this uh, 25 years ago as a consultant with Fannie Mae. And Fannie Mae at that time was transitioning to object-oriented development. And OSG, Object Systems Group, the company I was CTO of, was in there with about 20 to 25 developers, mentors, architectural people, and so on, helping to train and make, help them make this transition, come up with new software solutions, and so on. And of course, Object technology had a lot of hype at the time, uh, hence my book, Good Falls of Object Oriented Development. And one of the managers there, who, who actually knew, as, as per the comment, actually knew about software engineering and knew the realities, said he had someone over him who was saying, 
oh, we're doing object technology. We don't need to do quality assurance. It all just works. Uh, and I, I buried my face, yeah, pretty much did face palm, just like that. Uh, and so, what, what do you need from me? He said, I need you to write a white paper and explain to them how to do quality assurance for object technology. And I did. Uh, I wrote a rather detailed white paper. And in the process, stepped back and basically drawing upon all my experience, thought, what are all the things that affect quality in the software development process? He came up with this nifty diagram that I'm actually quite proud of. Someday I'll actually have to publish this somehow. Uh, you know, I'm simply talking about it here in class. The basic idea is that the problem is that you see, tend to see testing as just some component here in this long process. Uh, and something that's tacked on. And instead, quality assurance, in my opinion, is a whole set of activities that apply to every single activity and deliverable that you do in the software development lifecycle. So this is this is sort of the, and we're gonna, you're going to see this a lot, so don't worry about, certainly don't try to redraw this. The slides are out there. Someone DM me after class and tell me to look for a laser pointer. <laughs> uh, I was, I was, I, I need one. This is where I can use it the most. <clears throat> Basically, what you have here, the process activity, that is creating a deliverable or modifying a deliverable. Now that starts all the way back with analysis requirements, architecture design, creating source code or modifying source code, test plans, everything. Yes? Uh, this is super random, but I actually have this on me if you want to use it. Oh, cool. This. Uh, I, can, I can read <laughs> some of it. No, that's not random at all. That's awesome. <laughs> well played, good sir. I've, I've probably already shown this in here, but in case I haven't, I still have pocket protectors. <laughs> yeah. I only have pocket protectors. I have the same digital logic template I used in CS220. This isn't the same one, these break over the years, but the same one I used in 220 uh, 40 odd years ago. I am a geek. Anyway. <laughs> so this is your process activities and everything else here are all the quality assurance activities that help you produce a better version of what you're doing. First, you have inputs. For whatever you're doing, whatever your process activities here, methodology. Methodology will specify what you are creating. And it may, it may specify certain types of model diagrams. Uh, it may specify how it's to be formatted, what the shape of it is, and so on. You have existing deliverables. <clears throat> Most process activities, sometimes you're creating a brand new deliverable, but once you've done that, now a lot of your process activity is modifying an existing deliverable, or it's deriving a new deliverable off an existing one. If I have an architecture diagram that I can create, design diagrams. If I have a design diagram, I can create source code. If I have requirements, I can create a test plan. Guidelines and standards. Part of that is going to be derived from your methodology. Part of it is, how many of you have ever used a coding standard? Yeah. Why are coding standards useful? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. It makes things so much easier to read. It makes it easier to read everyone else's code. I had a coding standard at Pages. Uh, a few of the developers were, were less than rigorous about following it. And if I found myself in their code because I was debugging stuff, I would literally reformat their code. 
And this, we didn't have a lint for, or anything like that for Objective-C. So I would manually reformat their code to follow the coding standards. Uh, so guidelines and standards of all kinds. These can be, it can be coding, it can be, you know, coding idioms that you're using, it can be decisions as to how you're going to structure databases, what level of normalization you're going to have, or whether or not you have normalization. <coughs> Expertise. This gets overlooked. This is, this is, if, an uh, important aspect of quality is having people who know what they're doing and who have the relevant expertise. It helps to have someone who actually, if you're using a particular database technology, it helps to have someone who has expertise in that database knowledge. You're going to end up with a better database design. Key values. This is a big management thing. What are the key values for, for the company? things that we most care about for this product. So these all form inputs that determine what you're building. And, and the next slide simply describes all these here. Uh, templates are also very useful. You notice I have encouraged you repeatedly for each of your deliverables just to go back to other classes, earlier classes, and feel free to steal their stuff. And some of you have done that. That's the best kind of reuse. There's no reason to reinvent a new one. Find something that looks good and works. Any questions on the inputs here? And yet, companies often don't think about how important all of these are and how much they will influence, directly influence, the whatever deliverable you happen to be creating at the time. Question? Yeah. Um, methodology, that, that's referring to like? Agile, waterfall, okay. uh, your specific methodology. Uh, there, have been, there have been dozens and dozens of software development methodologies and resulting modeling techniques and formats and standards. Uh, I keep saying for a while there, there were people on uh, Quora who kept asking about UML, uh, Uniform Modeling Language. And uh, the answer that they were getting, the same answer I would have given, is UML was a thing like back in the late 90s. <laughs> I still have, I'm sure, a UML template. I, I have probably a dozen books about UML, and I don't think anyone uses it. Uh, sort of went out with rational growth. Story. Okay. Rational rows. Uh, computer aided software engineering. This was a big thing in the 90s. The idea was you lay out your object diagrams in a tool like rational rows and it spits out the source code. You don't have to write the source code. But of course, if you modify the source code and read it back in, it has to be able to handle anything that you've modified and won't necessarily. It was one of those great silver bullets of the late 90s that just never panned out. Uh, I think you can still get rational rows from IBM, but uh, I don't think anyone wants it. This is a little interlude on quality attributes. These, see, part of the issue with quality is people often don't ask what you're talking about. Weinberg says quality is value to some person. That gets back to the discussion about getting ahead of the Wrong arrows. Uh, key values. What is it your company cares about? Do they need to make it? They need a certain level of reliability. Uh, I worked on space shuttle flight simulators at NASA back in 79-80. The computers that ran the space shuttle were considered to be the highest quality software that had ever been produced. It was very interesting architecture. There were four computers uh, coded 
by IBM. The software is coded by IBM on these four computers. They read the exact same software. They had all the same inputs from all the various sensors and so on, and all the same outputs. And the way it worked was that <coughs> the four outputs were polled and majority ruled. This is sort of like minority, minority report, for those of you who've seen it. How many of you have seen minority report? Okay, a few. <laughs> At least a few. Anyway. Uh, so, the actual response on the panels and displays for the astronauts were based on what the majority of the four computers did. Now, typically, should be all four should have exactly the same answer. And if it was three of the four, then it was considered that there was some little anomaly with, with the software in the four that, you know, some transient voltage problem or issue that caused a problem. But the question comes, what happens if you have a two-to-two -two vote? There was a fifth computer. The software on it was written to the same specifications, but it was written by Rockwell, not IBM. It's a different software development team. Now, the other four computers were running identical software. The fifth computer was running software by Rockwell that was written to the same specification. And if there was a tie between the four computers, Rockwell had the deciding vote. That was the software that ran the space shuttles. That sounds like a terrible idea. Huh? That sounds like a terrible idea. No, it was, it was highly redundant. Because what you're dealing with is you're dealing with issues once you get up on orbit, you're dealing with cosmic rays that are not being shielded by, and you get random bit flips. So the idea was basically to protect it against anything that's random. The, and, and the irony of all this, the first space shuttle flight was delayed for 48 hours due to a software bug. The problem wasn't with the onboard computers. The problem was that there is, and this was actually my area of expertise, the part of the simulation that I worked on was what was called the launch processing system. This is the ground-based computer at Cape Canaveral that controls the shuttle until 30 seconds before launch, at which point it hands it over to the shuttle computers. Well, as it turned out, the problem was that there was a synchronization problem that the launch processing system and the onboard computers did not have their clocks in sync. There was a 40, I want to say millisecond difference between them. And so they could never agree as to the handoff. And it took them two days of frantic you know, coding, code, code analysis at IBM figure out the problem and finally launch the first shuttle flight. So, reliability, performance, how fast it goes, the features, what it's compatible with, how long it's going to last, how it's going to be deployed, how much support you have, and how much you're going to charge for it. And you have to decide what is acceptable for those features. Do you care about them? What is acceptable? <coughs> uh, there's a story that Jerry Weinberg tells in Psychology of Computer Programming about uh, a automobile company that's developing software to help specify models to be manufactured and it's not working. And this one developer is brought in from the outside and he sort of looks at it and it comes up with a different solution uh, and he gets it working. And he presents this to the team and someone on the team says, our solution says the stuff we have is 10 times faster. And he says, yeah, but yours doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Giving the wrong answer 10 times faster doesn't help. <laughs> Questions or comments before we move on? OK, so these two boxes are what you're doing. This is your process of either creating or modifying something. Whether that's your, and think about the things you've done. You've done your requirements, you've done your schedule, you've done your architecture, you've done, you're going to do a test plan, you've done your schedule, I never said that. Anyway, 
So typically what you're doing is you're either creating a new from scratch deliverable or you're taking an existing one, modifying it, and that's what you have now. You're doing this, you're doing something to something. You're creating or modifying some kind of deliverable. Everything else that's not yellow are your software quality activities to help you do the best job you can for doing this. And the problem is most organizations only look at this. Now, you can look at everything else and say, well, yeah, we talk about this, talk about this, but it's usually not thought of in terms of quality assurance. Everything else there is a quality assurance activity. So, as we said, analysis, specifications, yada, yada, yada. Okay, assessment. You have, roughly speaking, three types of assessment. You have metrics, which, as we said, should be automated, objective, and actually mean something. Uh, the trick with metrics is finding metrics that, that fill all three requirements. Reviews are human evaluations, code reviews. And you all have uh, one of your activities, individual activities to spend, I don't know what I say, a half hour reviewing teammate source code. And then you just check off and say, yeah, I reviewed the teammate source code. Uh, and <clears throat> we could do a whole class, frankly, on reviews and walkthroughs. I have half a dozen books by Jerry Weinberg just on that topic. Uh, I need to find that. I've got a, my favorite comic for code reviews. I'll see if I can drag that up for the next class. Uh, testing. <clears throat> this I could spend a whole class on because there's, there's a large number of different types of tests you can do. The current movement, particularly with DevOps, is towards automated testing. And yes, you want your testing to be as comprehensive and automated as possible. Because anytime you make change, to code, you run a risk of introducing new bugs or reawakening old ones that have been previously fixed. That's why regression testing is so important. But beyond that, there are so many different ways in which software can become unacceptable. And to go back to the your testing for reliability for performance, for functionality, for compatibility. These are a little harder to test. Deployment, you can try and do it in a, in a uh, environment. But, <clears throat> and when you assess this, then comes some sort of evaluation. That may be automated, that may be human, it may be a mix. But the goal of all of these is figuring out this new or modified deliverable, what do we think of it? Is it something to check into production? Uh, and how well is it tested? <laughs> A lot of systems like Facebook, they have continual integration. And they push stuff out. And I get stuff like, I've been having this, this problem on Facebook on not the app, but uh, through a web browser on the PC. It's got this pop-up little box with uh, the time and date that's actually obscuring some of the text underneath it. And there's no way to make it go away. Uh, I'm sure someone checked in a change, and I've, I've tried refreshing a few times, it still shows up. And I've actually asked other people and said, is anyone else seeing this? And some people are, and some people aren't. Uh, you want a gateway to decide whether or not you're going to push something into release. Well, let's talk about the next screen here. Feedback and control. New and modified deliverable, you evaluate it, you have some form of configuration management. Some way to, and this is, this is why you use GitHub, 
uh, or whatever you happen to use, you know, various uh, source code or document management systems. Some form of release management, which is side which you're going to put into production. Your evaluation may suggest ways to improve your process or your deliverables. <laughs> and you need some form of defect or feature management to say, okay, here are the, you know, we've closed this bug or we've we found new ones in the process of evaluation. You know, testing is going to reveal new defects which need to be managed. And those all become feedback to the process activity. So here's the whole diagram. <clears throat> this is how you build great software, by paying attention to everything here, making sure you're doing it, and it's being done right. Uh, you will find a lot of this in place at any given organization. The trick is looking for what's missing, seeing what they're failing to do, or seeing whether or not there are improvements that can be made in any of the aspects outside the yellow. By improving those aspects, you improve the quality of the software and the quality of the software development process. Yes? When we say metrics, in the top, top box in the green, metrics, yeah. is that referring to program output, or is that talking about metrics in terms of software development? Uh, well, we're back to the lecture we had a couple of weeks ago and the three, the three articles that I had on metrics. So kind of both? Yeah, it can, it can apply to anything. In fact, as I said, the, what seems part of the problem is that most metrics that are used in software development efforts are bad uh, or useless. Some, some are useless, some are actually misleading. Uh, and I mentioned that there are companies that have done instrumentation of the whole software development process, collecting data and finding which metrics are actually useful for predicting uh, progress in software. So, any questions here? I know we're going a little longer than normal, but hey, tough. Uh, you guys have been getting out an hour early for all semester long, so I don't care. Uh, any questions? Like I said, the slides are up there. Uh, why? Because it will be better. Okay, need you to build a test plan. Again, you're, you're like four weeks away from demoing. I'm not looking for a complex test plan at all. Look, look at prior semesters. Uh, oops, and there's one date I didn't catch. It's this Saturday. Uh, <coughs> Basically, your test plan should derive from your requirements design. And what I most care you focusing on is what you're looking for in terms of reliability, performance, and functionality. In other words, <coughs> test plan usually by definition is going to say here's what we're testing, so it's going to be reliability. This is here are the correct results that we want. Here's the response time that's going to be necessary. For some of some of it, if you really don't care about the response time, this is you know, very uh, static or very user input bound. Uh, functionality is <coughs> here are the features that we're testing for. So that those are the things to keep in mind. And like I said, the slides are out there. Oh, that's it. Uh, indicate what tests you're doing when you're done, what success, and some form of user acceptance testing. Any questions here? Oh, you all really are interested, though, aren't you? Okay, so those have to be up by midnight on Saturday. Uh, got a staff report to do also. You now, should now be done with uh, Peopleware, and you're gonna start on facts and fallacies, which is actually one of my favorite books. Uh, dated in one or two places, but heck, all these books are. Uh, and I really, Robert Glass has written several excellent books on software failures. So this is why this is such a good book to have. 
You're going to start on Webster 6, which is actually derived, it's simply a generalized version in the first three chapters of pitfalls of object oriented development. Because it's really pitfalls of software, and at least these are not specific to object oriented development, or at least not generalize them to any technology or methodology. Uh, you've got four weeks to read these, and you need to be, have those done by also your first demo is in four weeks, and the term is in five weeks. Any questions? Yes? Okay, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, that we need to start, because when I first saw it, I was like, oh, it's just like one blog post, like that's fine. Then I just opened the site, and there's like, Managerial, political. Uh, there's there's three collections, and each one has probably at least a dozen things. Yes. Now, they're all relatively short if okay. you actually go through a click and read them. But yeah, you've got four weeks to read these. So we're going to read every single one? Yep. Yep. Okay. And l let me tell you right off the bat these will be extremely useful on a midterm. Uh, the, uh, I, I've had midterms where I've had students who have tried to basically cite only these on every single one, which in some cases is kind of like, no, that doesn't really fit. Uh, but trust me, these, this, this is, and, and I've already mentioned this before, but you know, when we do the midterm return, this is one of your great cheat sheets. It's just to go to the, that list of pitfalls. You're going to look and say, oh yeah, that one probably applies to this risk, so I can, I can pull that in. Yes? The midterm is open text. Correct. Open text, open book, open internet. The, o the only thing I don't want you to do is ask each other. Okay? But other than that, you can do it. It's three hours timed, and that's my way of saying, okay, did you actually read the material? And trust me, one of the things I, I, have, I have learned is that when I start to grade midterms, and I love grading the midterms, uh, because it's where I get my satisfaction. It's like, yes, yes, my little lambs are ready to go out to the pool. <laughs> <laughs> they know what's going on. But I can tell if you really understand the material or not. It's pretty, when, when I, well, I'll look at the answer, and it's like, oh yeah, they really get this. And I'll look at the answer and say, like, okay, I know they opened their book and looked desperately through to try and find something they thought fit. Now, you can probably still pull that off for a B, quite frankly. <laughs> Unless it's really inappropriate uh, or not applicable, but uh, I, I can usually tell if you know the material. The better you know the material, the faster you can do it. Uh, <clears throat> typically, I've, I've had students finish a midterm in as short as an hour and a half. Uh, two to two and a half hours is usually more like it. Some of you will need the full three hours. Uh, I don't think I've gotten any uh, accessibility letters this semester, uh, but if, if, there, if you have an issue with, you know, reading impairment or anything like that that you think might slow you down on the test, uh, just ping me and I, I can give you a little extra time. Uh, but if you've been doing the reading, and this is why I changed this semester, the questions you have for the books, you're basically doing the midterm. It's not going to be the same questions. But it's be questions just like that. So if you understand, if you've, you've answered the stuff for Brooks, for DeMarco and Lister, and now for Glass, when you get the midterm, it's like, oh, this is the same thing he's asking. And you'll probably already have a good set of answers in mind, because you will have answered very similar questions. Any other questions? Thank you for not bumping the <laughs> there. Uh, that uh, see you all next week. Have a great week. Mm -hmm. um, I'll make a